Hello, welcome to the Informed Simplicity Project, a place for students looking for the informed simplicity on the far side of complexity. My name is Jalen Harris, and I will be your host today, as I have the unique honor of interviewing the creator of the Informed Simplicity Project, Dr. Jordan Harris. Welcome. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is weird. <laughs> so I'm excited to be able to interview you today. How do you feel? I feel good. I'm a, I'm a little, um, I'm just really excited, actually. I'm really excited. This is kind of different. Yeah, yeah. That's why I wanted to do this because you, <laughs> you've interviewed so many people and you're a therapist. <laughs> yeah. So like, you know, you deserve your own segment. You have your Thank own, you. Um, you know, you're a teacher, you're, you're your own knowledge base. And I wanted to start it with the realm of naming. Okay. So for your listeners who have been following for a long time or are just listening for the first time, tell us a little bit more about how you came to the name of the Informed Simplicity Project. Informed Simplicity Project, yeah, ISP. I think we all want ISP. Well, I want ISP. Right. <laughs> um, so basically, I'm actually, um, by the time this comes out, I will have posted an episode talking a little bit about my journey as a therapist. Oh, okay. But um, the big idea is I really, 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 really wanted to, to know how people did the things that they talked about in books. Right. You read some of these books, especially in the brief therapy tradition. And people do these incredible things in like five sessions, they change lives. And I wanted mm -hmm. to know like, how does that happen? And um, basically what I came to was that, um, well, so then I studied lots of people who said that they could do what they, what was written about in books. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of it was very simplistic. It was very childish. They didn't understand, I don't think that they understood what all of the dynamics that happened that went into these interventions to make them work. Um, and what I eventually came to was when you look across fields, the people who are high, who are, who are high level in any field, they, um, what they do appears simple, mm. but it's the informed simplicity um, of having a deep understanding of their field. So there's a, there's a quote, I think it's by um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who I don't know who that is, but I heard about it from Adam Robinson. And he says, um, I would trade, I wouldn't trade anything for the simplicity on this side of complexity, mm. but I would train, I would trade everything for the simplicity on the far side of complexity. Say that one more time, please. That's, that's <laughs> I wouldn't so trade anything for uh -huh. the simplicity on this side of complexity. Mm -hmm. But I would trade everything for the simplicity on the far side of complexity. On this side versus the far side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like an example of that would be, um, um, okay. There's this wonderful story that um, Jeff Zeig tells. Jeff Zeig is sort of the head honcho over at the Milton Erickson Foundation. Mm -hmm. And Erickson was the godfather of half of family therapy, wow. um, the father of modern hypnosis, mm -hmm. um, a psychiatrist, a, a psychologist, like just did crazy, crazy stuff. And so he tells this story about when he was a young, um, when Jeff was a young therapist, he went to go see Erickson to train with, with him. And uh, he had this pipe that he would smoke. He had this image of himself as a, psychologist, you know, with the pipe and the tweed jacket and the arm patches. And uh, Erickson told him stories for two hours mm. about how awkward people look when they do things that, that doesn't, that, that don't fit them. Mm. And after that, Jeff stopped smoking a pipe, right? <laughs> Just stopped. Um, so that sort of intervention works. So the people who I was reading and talking to, they, they assumed that if you just tell someone stories for two hours, then they would just change their behavior. Right. Um, 
And I don't, I don't believe that. Cause I think what's missing from that story is, um, okay. Why is Jeff smoking? He's smoking because of how he sees himself, uh, which is different than people who smoke for anxiety to, to relieve anxiety. Right. Mm-hmm. You also have the power dynamics between Erickson and Jeff. Jeff is already coming to him. Right. So he's going to be much more engaged in a process. If a client comes off the, comes off the street, and you tell them stories for two hours. They're going to say, this is ridiculous. This was a waste of my time. Like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to come back. Um, so there are all these other micro dynamics that go into any intervention that make it successful. Mm-hmm. But when people weren't talking about that, I found myself um, asking why when people weren't talking about that, they didn't know how to pass that on to me. And so a lot of the things I was doing like weren't working. Right. So, yeah. Because context is everything. Because context is everything. Heard. So um, I guess we can just cut the interview short because you've answered all my questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. But um, yeah, so that's how you came up with the name of the Informed Simplicity yeah. Project. Yes, because I would do things like that. I would tell people stories for an hour mm-hmm. and either they wouldn't change or they come back or they wouldn't come back. And I'd be like, why is this not working? I read the books. I did mm-hmm. the technique. Why is it not working? Right. Um, and it was a, it was a childish simplicity. Mm-hmm. Um, and that led to me sort of really thinking through, okay, what are, what do I need to know to really do what I read in these books? So I want to backtrack a bit in your, I'm still in the thinking about names, right? Mm-hmm. So you, Informed Simplicity Project, you should be named Behind the Mirror. Mm-hmm. And was that shift, a shift in model for you as a therapist? And then you also, as a person, used to be just Jordan Harris, you know? Mm-hmm. Minus the just. We didn't, we didn't need that. But <laughs> all lay people have this, Im- this, <laughs> this implied just. Um, but those of us who are doctors, like I'm not a doctor, but uh, <laughs> as a doctor. You should give an intro for, your, for yourself. I don't think people know who you are either. So I am the last born of the Harris Children Trilogy. Um, Book one is Jordan Harris, who transitioned into Dr. Jordan Harris. Um, Book two was Justin Harris. And now book three is Jalen Harris. I am a poet. I'm pursuing a graduate degree, a master's in fine arts and creative writing and design. So I'm also a designer. And I'm an educator. I teach writing composition at the University of Baltimore, where also I'm a student. Um, so that's who I am. Those are, yeah, in this book of my body, but I'm interested in how you transition from behind the mirror to informed simplicity and your journey also as into becoming a doctor, like yeah. what brought you into therapy why did you stay for so long? <laughs> yeah. Where do you want me to start first? So tell me more. Tell me about, the, I'm still on the name of the podcast. The so tell me how you shifted from Behind the Mirror to Simplicity. Yeah. So Behind the Mirror was the initial name of the podcast. Um, and in family therapy, there's this tradition of sitting behind a one-way mirror and watching um, other people work, mm-hmm. especially in your training years. And I shifted out of that practically like very practically because I um, wanted to grow the podcast and the name was taken. Oh, okay. Um, So I was looking for a new name and I was also um, asked by a friend of mine to give a training. And so when I was giving it, when I was preparing for the training, I was basically synthesizing everything I'd learned in the past six years about therapy and what I realized was the question that I had been asking myself for the past six years is, how do I do what was read about in the books? Hmm. Um, and so I gave a practice training. It was part of my learning process. And I think the learning process is doing, getting feedback and repeating. Um, I think mm-hmm. we think way too much. And that's 
I mean, I'm definitely one of the people who thinks way too much, mm -hmm. but um, so I think doing is very important. And when I was doing, when, so I went to give the presentation um, in a shortened form as a practice for my, the training that I was giving, um, the quote that resonated the most with people was the quote from, the, from Oliver Wendell Holmes, which was also a quote that mm -hmm. resonated with me, you know? And I said, there's something here. There's something here. People want to know how to be really good at what they do. Mm -hmm. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, huh, maybe I won't change a life today. Like, <laughs> like, like nobody says that, right? Mm -hmm. So when I got that feedback, I said, okay, I have the name. Now I know what I want to do. Oh, okay. And it's something that I feel comfortable in. Um, mm -hmm. because this is really what I've, it also sums up what I've been trying to figure out for the past six years. Right. Um, and so all of those things sort of came together and the informed simplicity project was sort of born. Born. Yeah. Wow. So that happened in you doing. That happened and, in the doing. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. it was something that it wasn't like you sat down and had a huge brainstorming session. You sat down and you had to pre prepare for a training. <laughs> I, would, I mean, I would imagine as much like what you do when you're writing and you send it off to an editor and then they give you feedback. Yeah. Like you can think about it for as much as you want, but until you get feedback from the outside world, something is just missing. Yeah. And yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. Um, audience impact and response is a lot of how my work is developed and also dreaming sleep rest like being outside of the question that i'm trying to answer yeah time away from it or exercise like you know like doing other things doing <laughs> yeah and then in retrospect i'm like oh it'll hit me you know yeah um yeah so how did you stumble into marriage and family therapy or how did you get into marriage and her there? Because I knew you stumbled into it. So that was I did. Answer. I did stumble into it. Yeah, that's a crazy story as well. So I was in Papua New Guinea, mm -hmm. which is on the edge of the earth. When was this? 2011. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, so I got a scholarship, a fellowship, a scholarship. It was a scholarship. I was a McNair scholar. Awesome. To do um, research. And they gave you like two grand. And so... I took that two grand and I went overseas to study traditional religion in Papua New Guinea, mm -hmm. which is like, um, <laughs> it's between, you know, like Australia and like the edge of the earth. Like it's, it's, just, it's just so far away from anything that most people in the States have even ever heard of. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was over there studying traditional religion and, um, staying with some, some expats um and one of them asked me like what are you going to do to like change what are you going to do to put good back into the world basically wow and i was like i uh, don't know uh, i'm 21 <laughs> <laughs> yeah i had i had wanted to go and study anthropology after that um, oh, okay but i was kind of convicted you know from that question yeah um, so powerful <laughs> yeah it was it was very powerful so i came back to the states mm -hmm. and i was living with, with my brother at the time and i had some friends who were still in searcy arkansas and one of them mentioned he was going into the mft program um so i went with him to meet with one of the teachers the teachers gave me a book called mm -hmm. the family crucible i said read it get back to me tell me what you think so I read it, um, and I brought the book back to him the f after, like after the semester had already started. Oh, okay. He said, "What'd you think?" I said, it was, "It was a great read. I really enjoyed it." He said, "Well, you know, if you want to join the program, you can come on in." And I was like, "What?" <laughs> he said, "Where? How far into the semester did he invite you to just come on?" Um. In? It was about a week into the semester. Okay. So it wasn't like halfway. It was a week. They had just started. They had just started. I hadn't taken the GRE. I hadn't right. applied. I had not done the application. 
hadn't talked to anyone else. <laughs> uh, I talked to one other teacher. So I went to my McNair advisor mm-hmm. and she said, you know, um, well, I don't know about that program, but there's a professional <laughs> counseling program on campus that I can even get you into if you really mm-hmm. want, to, want to do this. Mm-hmm. You should talk to them. So I went and talked to, to that lady, the head of that program. She said, yeah, we'd be happy to have you just show up on Monday. So I had two programs that I was like, I guess I can choose whatever I want. Um, and there was a lot of anxiety because I was going to go to South Africa and study anthropology. Like, if I go down this route, the other door shuts. Right. Um, so you had just finished undergrad. I had just, yes, I had just finished undergrad in that summer, like late July. This is like early August. Right. And they're like, you go to grad school right now, right here in Arkansas. Right. Right. But um, you wanted to study in South Africa. Right. Right. Um, and then I thought, what's up with all these programs? Just let people walk into their programs. <laughs> like, like yeah. I have done nothing. And that Sunday, I met a lady who got rejected from the program. The MFT program? Yes. Wow. And I was like, okay, they don't let anyone in. <laughs> <laughs> like, she had applied. She had done all, you know, done her GRE and all that stuff. And she didn't get in. And I was like, okay, maybe this is like a, a God thing. So I walked in to that program on Monday, the MFT one. I emailed the other one. Thank you very much, but I'm, I can't accept. And um, then, yeah, the rest is history. I proceeded to read everything that was given to me, plus half of uh, one teacher's library. I probably, I probably read. Wow. Probably not half of us. Probably a third of his library. Just you know. In that two-year span. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then I went on to do my doctorate, and here I am. Yeah, so why did you do a doctorate? Because I also know that you met someone in the program. Yes. And um, a very special woman in our lives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I met, I met, I met my uh, wife in the program, mm-hmm. in my, my master's program. Um, we started dating in marriage class. No, we started dating hilarious. in next class. We got <laughs> engaged in marriage class. Um, and at the end of my time in the program, I wanted to do for other students what my teachers had done for me. Mm. Um, so I decided to get a doctorate because the only way you teach on a doc level for, well, yeah. If you want to teach in a, in a MFC program, it's helpful to have a doctorate. Mm-hmm. You don't actually need it as much as I thought you did. Okay. Um, but it's helpful to have the credentials. Right. And um, my program was very centered on the person of the, 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 the therapist. And having read a third of my professor's library, mm-hmm. um, I wanted to learn what I'd read about in all of these books. I wanted to do, to learn to do what I had read about in all of the books. So I applied for a program that specialized in brief therapy. Brief. Brief systemic uh, therapy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, went down and did my doctorate at ULM. Yeah. University of Louisiana Monroe. Right. So it was the teaching aspect you wanted to do that you wanted to give back and the brief therapy, those two things. Yeah. I wanted to get really good at what I did and I wanted to mm-hmm. be involved in students' lives. And you want to be involved in students' lives. Yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know who you are. And that's and here I am. Dr. Jordan Harris. Dr. Jordan Harris. So, um, what was it that trans, what was the transformation for you? into studying hypnosis more like where what models did you start out using yeah. and then how did you, how, how did you become the dude who goes to on scholarship to hypnosis conferences <laughs> and teaches people <laughs> and certifies people in hypnosis like yeah so um the te- so 
the the teacher who I read at the Earth Library um, was a member of ASH, the American Society of Clinical Hypnotists, okay. and had basically trained and learned hypnosis for a very long time. Wow. And to me, it was such an alluring part of the field because brief therapy comes out of the work of Milton Erickson, who was okay. the godfather of the field. Of MFT and hypnosis. Yeah, I would say he's like the god, he, probably he's the grandfather of, um, so if you look at family therapy, hmm. it can loosely be, be divided into two parts of the field. You had the brief people over in like California and you had the more in-depth people who were over in, I think they were in like Philly, Washington, DC, those sorts mm. of areas. East coast, West coast. Of it, was, it, it really was an East coast, West yeah. coast. Uh -huh. um, East coast was, East coast was all about like, let's take them to your family of, of origin. Okay. And then West coast was all like, um, let's solve this four to 10 sessions and be done. Wow. Um, and I had basically, I was really enamored with the West Coast people, partly because they were helping people very quickly, but because they talked a lot about paradox hmm. and what they were doing seemed to me to be the same sort of thing that people like Gandhi and King were doing on a societal level. Hmm. Right. In my opinion, Gandhi and King were doing things that appeared paradoxical, but were really brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. Like they, they appeared almost stupid, but they were really ingenious. Um, and then I hear these brief therapy stories on an interpersonal level and I'm like, they're doing the same thing. It's just a different, it's just what level are you working at? Um, and so to understand them, I started reading a lot of the hypnosis literature, um, and that's how I read about a third of that teacher's library, just because he would just feed me books. Wow. So it was in your MFT program when you got into hypnosis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So pretty early on. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's definitely, f yeah, foundational, I guess, for me. Foundational for you, which isn't true for a lot of people. Like, a lot of people start out in different models, I would assume. Yeah. And then they go into, like, trance, like, later on, you know? So it's interesting that that was like foundational for you. <laughs> yeah. I think, I mean, I hadn't thought about this, but I think some of this is um, how the program was set up. Mm. My sense of a lot of programs now is that they don't go deep into any model. Mm. Everything is sort of a skim of different models. And so I think my program, because we went deep into different models, mm -hmm that gave me the opportunity to go deep into hypnosis. Oh, okay. Um, and so I think that's a structural difference probably that gave me a gift that I couldn't have had otherwise. I mean, I remember, I remember this, I hadn't thought of this in years. I remember talking with a guy who went through the LPC program, the other program on campus. So I'm the one that you to, emailed them and said, you're not gonna right, go to. Right. Okay. <laughs> so I'm in the MFT program and he's in the LPC program. Uh -huh. And we're talking about class and whatnot and he said yeah i studied the mft models i said you studied the mft models he said that's two years of study <laughs> <laughs> he said yeah we had a course on it i said yeah you, you had a course on the on the family models yeah yeah what did you um what did you learn we learned all of them <laughs> like, what are you talking about <laughs> like what are you saying right now that's what i'm thinking it's like yeah like yeah. you know solution focused and like all the other models i'm like I don't know what you're talking about. There's no way you could have studied all the family therapy models in one course. Like, right. But you can, if you don't go deep, you know? Right. Absolutely. So yeah, it was a bizarre sort of like, mm -hmm. you don't know that you don't know what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> like, was... Especially like the context of how the information is being presented to you. You're like, yeah. we're going to study the MFT models in this unit. So you think I studied them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't actually know. Cause yeah. yeah. So um, what is hypnosis, Jordan? <laughs> yeah. Hypnosis is um, 
That's a great question. So I'm going to say this, and a lot of people are going to be mad at me who study hypnosis. Hypnosis is, it's not a model. Okay. It's a way of working. It's a modality. And what it allows you to do is um, focus attention. Hmm. Hypnosis is just, it's, I think it's actually, it's everyone who studies the field says that it's actually a really bad name. Um, wow. A better name is monoideism, like one idea. Because if you have a, because what you're really doing is helping people to focus on one thing at a time. Every day when you're walking around, your mind is focused on eight different things. Right. But um, if you're going to work with hypnosis, you're working to focus attention. So you're working to focus attention. Yeah. And so then is there a model you use? What people end up doing is they end up applying whatever their model, their theory of change is to uh -huh. hypnosis. Okay. Right. So I was, I got trained in hypnosis initially by a guy named Douglas Flemings who does brief therapy all the west coast stuff mm -hmm. and so my initial teachings in hypnosis like formal education in it was from that lens the brief therapy tradition plus hypnosis right i came back from a training this year um, with a guy named dan cohen with nifty which this is, is the conference. national yeah it was the nifty conference okay national pediatric hypnosis training institute wow um and they do a lot of CBT. Okay. Right, cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and so they use hypnosis for that. So people end up using their model of change to enhance, they, people end up using hypnosis to enhance whatever their model already is. Mm -hmm. So how would you define the model that you use? The model that I use is most closely related, related to um, emotionally focused therapy and basically my theory of change is um, that if you can sit with your pain and have compassion on yourself mm -hmm. then you win mm. that's the whole idea you know when because what happens in, in my opinion is people get um people get down on themselves right yeah. something happens they stereotypically take a drink when they've been sober for 10 years and they beat mm. themselves up, mm -hmm. right? Because oh, I've messed up 10 years of, of sobriety down the drain. Right. Um, and then it's that negative spiral where they feel bad about themselves that pushes them to go do something else that's problematic. Right. Uh, when, you know, in, in my experience and what I've studied, if you can have compassion on yourself, then you end up being able to self-correct. Mm. So that's, that's my theory of change. And relationships is the same. When you can drop into your pain, name it and share it with your partner and then receive comfort from them. You can, you're, you're fine. Like that's, that's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the, that's the end goal. So this is a question that maybe is, it's broad, but would you also, I was going to ask you like, what would you classify a healthy person as? What type of tools or skills are they using? Would you say that that model of dropping into your pain, communicating how you feel, having what you said be received, that cycle. Yeah. Is that a, of a healthy person? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's exactly what a healthy person is. Um, I think people sometimes think that if they're healthy, they won't feel pain. Right. Or if they're healthy, 
mistakes from their past won't come up. Mm -hmm. And I think the reality is, like I used to work at a, um, at a, at a senior care um, psych ward. Mm -hmm. right? Wow. So I'd have people who were, the first day I showed up, I had a guy who was in World War II. What? Yeah, the first the first day. How old was he? I guess he was in his nineties. Like he was just he was wow. a, a World War II vet, and he, you know, so we were. I was doing a group, and I come in and I say, "Okay, tell me, what was your favorite job you ever had?" Mm -hmm. And he's like, "Favorite job? <laughs> Back in my day, you didn't have favorite jobs. You just did whatever you had to do." Matter of fact, I was storming the beaches of Normandy when your lot was back home sitting around. And I'm like, actually, my lot wasn't born. <laughs> you know, my, my lot, lot we wasn't not, born. Like, we were not sitting around also. <laughs> like, <laughs> Historically. Yeah, that's also true. Um, but, but what I learned from these people was if, you live, if you're blessed to live long enough, you're going to have heartbreak. Absolutely. You're going to have pain. Um, I'd ask questions like, how many siblings did you, how many siblings do you, do you have? And they say alive or dead? Like, Oh, wow. That type of, yeah. You know? And so it's going right. to, pain is going to come. Right. And it's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. um, and some pain you can get over, you can move through mm -hmm. and some pain you won't. I, I, I don't know if, if you died, if I would ever be the same, I think I might always be a little sad about that. You would always be changed. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think that the idea is that we'll never feel pain again. I think the idea is mm -hmm. that when it comes, how do you relate to yourself? How um, do you relate to yourself? Yeah. Can you relate to yourself with compassion and comfort? Yeah. Are you, you know, if, if if you die, do I say to myself, I should be over this? Why why am I still dealing with this? This is right. maybe something's wrong. Or do I go, yeah, my sister died, mm -hmm. and it's sad, and I miss her. And forever. Yeah, you know. So <laughs> right. Um, that's what I think a healthy person is. Mm -hmm. And the more you can do that, the healthier you you are. Are there ways that um. So you as a facilitator, as a therapist who meets with people, are there ways that you are in giving people skills? Like, is there a way for me to practice EFT trance with myself? Is that what you do in session? Like, what are you doing in session? This is my question. That's a great question. <laughs> What do you actually do? Are you giving me the skills or are you practicing the skills on me and then later on and I'm cha and there's a, there's a change that happens in session or later on I'm able to model that for myself? Um, Maybe those are two different questions. What are you doing in session, Jordan? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, that depends on which, on which session. Okay. Um, in general, what I'm doing in session is I'm trying to get you to drop into your pain mm -hmm. and then have an experience where you give yourself compassion. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the, the main goal. So if you were my client, right. And you said, my brother died. Mm -hmm. If you're in my office, there's probably some way in which you're trying to get out of your pain. Maybe right. you're smoking, maybe you're, um, watching movies all day, right? Maybe mm -hmm. you're so exhausted you can't get out of bed. I don't know what that is. But there's also some sort of internal process that keeps that moving, right? So if I were to say to you, um, so your brother died, what's, what's that like? You might respond, well, you know, it's not really that big of a deal. I mean, we, we knew that he was, he was sick. Mm -hmm. And so... What you're telling me, what you're, what you're doing, if I ignore the words, but watch what happened is you bounced out of it. Right. So my job is to acknowledge and have compassion on that, on that sort of um, defensiveness, that protection. Right. And then also to sort of hold you in that place with that pain, right? 
look, of course. So there's a part of you that says, I knew this was, I knew this was going to happen. And probably knowing it, having it being predictable mm-hmm. made it hurt less. Mm-hmm. And yet there's a part of you that can't get out of bed because there's some, some, some pain. Is that close? Right. So I want to, of course, acknowledge and have compassion on you protecting yourself mm-hmm. from that pain, but also like open up space for you to talk about the pain. And then, you know, once you can do that, so you say, yeah, I guess that is true. You know, I might say, say, I might say something like, when you think of yourself, you know, and that part of you that holds that pain, what do you, what do you say to her? Yeah. You know, and what I'm listening for is, it's okay. What often happens is, is people say, I just tell her that she's got to get out of bed. Like, it doesn't matter how she feels. She's got to get out of bed. Mm. So then my job is, okay, let's explore why she is in bed. So her brother, who she's known for 20 some years, is gone. Who did, she, who did she talk to about this? Oh, she can't tell anyone. She can't tell anyone about it. So not only is she dealing with, with this pain, mm-hmm. but she's dealing with it all alone. Right. What does she need to hear? Being all alone in the middle of this pain, the only safe place for her is to sit in her bed all day long. Right. What does she need to hear? Um, and hopefully you can respond to her with some compassion. So that's a brief synopsis of my, of the bulk of my therapy. That to me sounds like EFT. It's very, yeah. There are a few things I do that I don't know if people in the EFT world would say are congruent with their model, but the majority Mm -hmm. of it is, yeah. So where does the hypnosis come in? Yes. So I use hypnosis primarily. So I've also thought a lot about how do you structure therapy yeah um and so i typically use i can i typically don't use hypnosis um how can i say this okay i don't use hypnosis as a model i don't think it makes sense right but because hypnosis is a set of tools for focusing attention Mm -hmm. what that also means is that hypnosis is really something that happens every day Mm. right Mm. if you're listening to this podcast now and you are enthralled Mm. you're technically in a trance because we have sonorous voices i just want to point that out yes (laughs) the most (laughs) yeah um and so what that means is that you know if you look through the lens of hypnosis, there are all these fancy words for things that are really everyday things, mm. right? Um, your, your phone focuses your attention. Absolutely. Have you ever been lost in a Facebook hole or a Yo, YouTube tunnel? Or YouTube tunnel, then you were quote unquote in a trance. These things are mm. all, these are all normal, normal things. The benefit of hypnosis, right? The benefit of understanding how focus attention works mm-hmm. is that it, it allows you to help um, people bring their bodies back into balance. Right. The human, the human body wants to be back in balance because balance is where we feel is where we feel comfort. Right. Powerful. Um, and what happens sometimes, though, is that the body learns something else. Like, um, and these are these are what habits are. Mm. Right. If you ever sit down to your computer, I do this. Whenever I sit down to my computer to do my notes, I get. I used to get this bad feeling of like, ugh, my body is in the habit of feeling bad when I do notes. Um, what are notes? Notes for like my clients and stuff. You're just like you taking notes after, about the session to, after. You, you have to, yeah, after, after your session, you have to do notes. Okay. For insurance most of the time. Okay. Um, so my body is, is, is in the habit. So what I do in session three typically is I help people change some part of their experience that's a habit if it's helpful to, to them. 
and that's where it comes in. Um, yeah, it's kind of a technical question. It's also hard to answer because I don't technically use formal hypnosis with people most of the time, but I don't think it's necessary. Mm. You don't usually use it in session, but so when does it come up for you? It mostly guides how I Structure. interact with people, mm. right? So like, so let's say, this is such a technical question, it's kind of hard to answer. Um, okay, I'll give you this example. If you come in to see me mm -hmm. and you say, okay, I'm not sleeping, I'm in my bed all day, I'm depressed. Part of what's going on, I'm assuming, is that your body is bringing, is giving you some sort of feeling, makes it hard to get out of it. Maybe there's a literal feeling of heaviness. Right. So then what I'll do is I'll say, okay, this is session three. This is a resource session. And one of the things you told me is that it's hard to get out of bed because there's this feeling of heaviness. You can feel that now. And you might say yes. I say, okay, go ahead and notice as that feeling of heaviness increases mm. or decreases. I know that that happens and that that works because I know that focused attention mm -hmm. can help change the body and bring the body back into balance. Mm -hmm. Right? So part of what you're telling me is this thing of heaviness is taking up so much of my energy and my attention that I can't get out of bed. Right. But if I understand that that's how you're, that's where you are, and I understand that focus attention can change things, I'll just ask you to change it. Right. So you don't, I don't technically need to do a full induction 90% of the time. It's just unnecessary. Hmm. Now, there are certain issues like um, bedwetting or mm -hmm. asthma, um, where if I was working with a kid, I might do a favorite place induction. I might have them imagine being in their favorite place we might do that for five to, to ten minutes but for the majority of the things that people experience i don't find it necessary to do a formal induction wow it's very interesting very very interesting yeah so i'll give you an example this is this is i mean this sounds so crazy but like it's really normal okay. so um, a few years ago, I was working at a drug, drug addiction place, and I was doing my intake. And this guy comes in, and he's talking about all this stuff, and we have a pretty good relationship. And he says, you know, I haven't slept in, like, days, and I feel like I'm crawling out of my skin. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, that sounds miserable. It's like, yeah, it's like my mind just will not rest. It just keeps going and going and going, and it's, like, spinning and spinning and spinning. And... So where's all of his attention? Everywhere. It's in a circle. It's in the circle. It's this high energy thing. It's spinning, it's spinning, it's spinning. That's where that's focus. That's pulling a lot of his focus, right? It's coming out of his body. It feels like it's coming out of his body. Absolutely. Mm. So what that means is that's already hypnotic for him. Mm -hmm. So what I say is, you know, I um I have a buddy who tells this strange story about wolves. He says that wolves have this thing where after they've been out hunting all day long, they come back and um, some of them are still amped up and they need to be, they need to be in order to protect themselves from outside predators. So what happens is one or two of the wolves will pace around the perimeter all night long, pacing back and forth in this circle, in this, in this rhythm. And the rest of the wolves, because they are pacing around, have the safety to fall asleep. Mm. And I'm telling him this story, right? And he's looking at me 
and his body physically relaxes. Mm-hmm. So I say, what do you know? He's like, man, yeah, that story resonates. Like, sometimes things just need to calm down. But like, yeah. Okay, just enjoy that for five to ten more minutes. It's perfectly fine, man. And he calms down, and he leaves, and he goes back to the rest of the facility. I don't need to do an, an induction. He's already he's already in a trance. Mm-hmm. He's already hypnotized because we're, his his attention is already focused on this feeling of spinning and moving and being hyper vigilant. I just need to help him use it in a way that's compassionate. Right. So that's a real okay. This is a story you thought of on the spot. That when, was a story, in that session? No, that was a story that Douglas told me when I did my hypnosis training with, with him. So you do, you do use stories. Stories are, the role of stories are important in trance work. I use whatever I need to to guide and focus attention. For, use whatever you need to. For compassion, towards compassion. Mm-hmm. I'm just really impressed that this came to your brain at this time. You know what I mean? That you could recall this story about wolves. <laughs> like, like that just, it just seemed too relevant. <laughs> like, where did you, where did you access that? I'm like, did you make that up? Like, did, was it really a friend? Like, but this was, a, it just came to you and that. It just came to me. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's like any sort of training. If you train at it, then you can do it. If you don't train at it, you can't do it. And do you feel yourself, because what I'm hearing is you've worked with elderly people. You've worked with people who have substance abuse, who are dealing with substance abuse. You've worked with people who are in, who have some type of psychosis. Like you've worked with a lot of different populations of people. Are you seeing patterns across these populations and that's also why you're able to access certain stories or methods mm. like pretty quickly. Mm. I've, I mean, I think there are patterns that I've seen. I don't know if that's helped me access different stories though. Okay. But there's definitely patterns. Yeah. Um, I'm really interested in your sessions because I had an experience with you earlier this year. <laughs> I don't know if I, if I, uh, have told you, it's just a strange, something really weird happened. I came to visit you in like, I think it was February. It was your birthday. Mm-hmm. Mom and I came to visit and you were like, let's do a thought experiment. <laughs> And I did not think of that as, oh, my brother is about to hypnotize me or whatever, <laughs> right? Like, right. I, it wasn't until like months later when someone, I was telling someone about the work that you do. And um, there were, or someone just asked me, I just said, you know, my brother, he, his focus is in hypnotherapy and he uses EFT as a model. Da, 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 da. And they're like, has he ever hypnotized you? And I was like, no. And then I stopped. I said, wait, what? <laughs> I was like, has he? <laughs> I had to really think about that question. Because <laughs> you remember, I hope you probably remember this, but you took me into the garage of your house and you sat me in a chair and we thought visually about the past, present, and future. Right. And at the time, I was, you know, I'm just a little innocent. Like, yeah, my brother, yeah, he's taking me to the room. He's like, he wants to practice. I think I'm like, yay. But after the session, I don't know how long we were in there. This whole, it was like I felt a type of integration. Mm. I felt like before that time, because I've had so many pe- lives, <laughs> I've had a lot of different. I've been in a lot, I've lived in a lot of different places. I had a lot of different friend groups. I've had a lot of different experiences, you know, like 
I always have felt like my younger self has been haunting me mm. or in competition with my present self. And my, my present self is unsure of where my future self is taking mm -hmm. this journey. <laughs> but during that time of us visually, you asked me, where is the past, present, and future for me? Like physically, like where do I see them? And how do they feel? Or so, something along the lines of that, right? Mm -hmm. And after that, and it was such a, and I, I'm trying to figure out, did you see a shift in me? Because when I hear you talk about sessions with your clients, there's always a moment where you see someone calm down or relax or their eyes get bigger, you know, like there are cues that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and if you remember that session we had, was there a moment that felt like you could see there, there was some type of change? I remember that. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't remember any cues from that. Mm -hmm. um, not that there weren't, I just, I don't think I was, I, that was more exploratory than change work. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if I was focused on what's the thing here. What's the thing there. What's the difference between those two things? Exploratory versus change work. Well, I learned this new thing and I said, do you want to try it out? Oh, okay. And you were like, yeah. And so you were just literally like, practicing. You <laughs> yeah, I was like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, let's see what this works. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. And I think I, I remember that we made some some shifts that you didn't like, and so we put it back. Like we, we just. It was. It was making it right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a perfect example. I, I think. I think honestly, that kind of leads to the idea that like there is no such thing as hypnosis. Mm -hmm. In a sense, hypnosis is just a way of wor working with focused attention, right? Mm -hmm. But you would never call someone a like. I don't know, a syringeologist because they work with mm -hmm. syringes, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about the syringes, it's about the medicine. Um, and really that's why I think the history of, of hypnosis, quote unquote, is so, so marred. People were obsessed with the technique and the approaches, but they weren't actually helping people, they were hurting people. Mm. And so that came back to bite them in the butt. How are they hurting people? So, um, I think it was in the 1700s. Yeah. Um, it starts with exorcism. Right? So, so in the seven, late, late seven, mid 1700s, I want to say, the um, Catholic Church had the monopoly on, on, on exorcisms. And in France, there was this one guy, I think his name was Briard who was crushing it as an exorcist. And he would induce, induce these really like um, intense sort of like convulsions in people as the demons came out. Mm -hmm. And the church in France didn't like that the Catholic church had, had, had this much power. So they sponsored a, a guy named um, Anton, I think his name was, to sort of do battle with him. And Anton had this new technique based off of Newtonian physics um because newton said that part of part of his theory was like there are these magnetic forces in people that influence um that, that respond to, to magnets on the outside hmm. so he came up with this thing called animal magnetism and they used him to debunk briard well a decade later he fell out of favor and they wanted to to debunk him. So he brought in Benjamin Franklin to debunk this guy. And Benjamin Franklin said that this guy is basically a charlatan. Everything that he's doing is just suggestion. But his people, Anton's people, kept doing Anton's work. And um, his last, Anton Mesmer, um, mm -hmm. his people basically were certified in doing mesmerism. But it sounds like all along the way, they were they were kind of shady. They would get a lot of calls from women hmm. 
Um, and they would make these women like convulse and, and writhe. Um, and it sort of came to a head in the 1800s, I want to say. Mm -hmm. And there was a book came out called Sven Galley about this older hypnotist guy who was sort of like seducing this younger woman as he was doing hypnosis with her or mesmerism. Um, and so they were just shady people, right? Like I'm yeah. sure anybody today can talk about any number of life coaches or yoga instructors who are a little bit on the shady side. Mm -hmm. um, but I, hmm. You know, um, and what came out later was a lot of these women, like the vast majority of them had been victims of sexual abuse. But yeah. we didn't know what that, well, they didn't know, they really didn't know what that was until much later. So they, they were they were just shady. They were shady people doing shady things. Um, but, yeah, that's not, yeah. I mean, you can do shady things with, with anything, right? Right. So. So that, uh, that makes me think like, is it the authority that we give that is given to someone who is a doctor or a therapist that influence the type of power suggestion works? And is there, that's the question. And then also I want to know, is there something I can practice with myself? Yeah. And it, is it based on giving myself authority? Yeah. So it's, it's based on focus attention. What focuses your attention, right? And I think this is where the attachment piece comes in because I do like EFT is mm -hmm. like, where do you go to co-regulate? So what we know from tons and tons of research is there is a certain number of people who will respond to authority, hands down. Mm -hmm. But there are so many more people who will respond to connection. Okay. And connection is always, always, always a long-term solution. Mm. Um, so the more power, I mean, there's like, there's, there's everybody, even like hardcore people, like um, the people who interrogate um, hostages or FBI people who negotiate, I mean, the F, people in, F, in, in law enforcement who negotiate with, who interrogate terrorists, yeah, people in law enforcement who negotiate with hostage takers like they are also using empathy and connection based techniques right because they're just the more powerful technique right hmm. so but but what happens is the small number of people in the short term who respond to authority they usually look more dramatic so they get more attention okay does that make sense that does make sense um so the authority piece is not as strong or transformative or powerful as no, connection. Not at all. But it just, I mean, if you can make, if you can quote unquote, make somebody writhe on the ground, then it looks right. more fancy, even so, though yeah. you're not actually doing better work. And is the change as long-term? Well, that's the whole history of the field is like, for some people, the change has worked. For other people, it hasn't. Mm -hmm. And they don't know why it's so in inconsistent. And it's because the method, their 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 end goal was it, it's it's not a it's not it's a it's a short term weak end goal. It looks strong, mm -hmm. but it's not ultimately strong. It's very weak. It's it's just brittle. Brittle. Uh, and are there techniques that you use on yourself? Yes. Yes. So basically, every day. Mm -hmm. I do a meditation, 15 to 20 minutes. And what I do is, um, there's three different things that I do. One of them I talked about earlier on the podcast with Connie Ray Andreas. I'll do the, she does this process called the wholeness process. Mm -hmm. And before she invented the wholeness process, she invented this process called core transformation. I, I, I do, I do both of those at times. The thing I've done most, the most re recently, 
is a variation of breathing mindfulness, right? Okay. So what I'll do is I'll sit down, close my eyes, I'll take my time to settle in. Um, and I'll have my phone set for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And I'll just notice what feels good in my body. Okay. And I sit with that. And every so often, an image or a memory will, will pop up. And if it's a memory that's emotionally charged, what I do is I give myself what I wish I would have had, what I, what I needed in that situation. Yeah. So um, the other day, this random memory popped up of something stupid I said when I was in college. Mm-hmm. Pretty random. So random. And so... I just went back to that memory, stayed with that, and I apologized to the person. Wow. Um, and I just noticed how that felt. And then I just went back to feeling whatever feels good in my body. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, wait till something else pops up. Um, occasionally, there'll be something throughout the day that I go, that's a button for me. And I'll bring that up in my... And your meditation. My meditation. So you do it at the end of the day? I do it at the beginning of the day. So I'll save it for the next day. Okay. So that's what I'd recommend. Or, you know, listen to Connie Ray's stuff. Um, mm-hmm. She's brilliant. It's really interesting for me to hear you talk about your journey because a lot of the, what I've been, this year has been a, a year of transformation for me Mm -hmm. and it started with swimming Mm -hmm. and a lot of the things you talk about are how I think about how I've experienced in the doing of swimming and I um, took an adult as you know I took an adult beginner swim class last year this time for a semester 15 weeks two hours each week a group of 23 to 80 year olds, black, white, Indian, East Asian, like all races, ages, genders, we were just in the water together, right? And it was a time of uh, fear. I was really scared about learning how to swim. But being in an environment with people who didn't know, who were also older, who were just doing this for the first time was really empowering. And you also put me on to total immersion swimming. Terry Laughlin mm-hmm. and his whole swimming philosophy is a life philosophy. <laughs> it is, it really is. And it's not just in text, but it's in doing because I started reading, I listened to the podcast with him and um, what's the other guy? Oh yeah, Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss, yeah. Terry Laughlin and Tim Ferriss have a wonderful podcast just before Terry passed. Yeah. It was like wild. It was like the last interview this guy ever did. Like, he was just... And his whole thesis is to create less drag in the water. How can we swim like fish? And that's a life thesis. How can we have less drag in our lives? And the time that I've spent reading that book and essentially teaching myself how to swim, I had these skills and a confidence in that class, but I didn't have the technical knowledge and I didn't have the the thesis of fish like swimming, creating less drag, the water was a place where I would go and meditate and where I would be in trance. And at first it was, how can I survive the situation? I'm scared. I got to get from this side of the pool to the end of the pool from three feet to 12 feet. Yeah. Um, there's a, I feel like I'm in a very surveilled environment. There's someone on a tower on a, as a lifeguard and there's a bunch of like, older white men who are just going at it in the water, (laughs) right? Who seem highly proficient. I've just learned the skill. I don't even know if I can make it to the other side. I'm not doing laps, plural. Like, how can I survive, right? And what do I need to hear to survive? Which I hear is a part of how you are using EFT. What do I need to tell this person or say to them so they know that we're here right now this is how you feel and what do you need to hear to survive? And so 
as someone who has come into swimming and had to tell myself what I needed to do is to get from one end of the pool and back again. And after it wasn't just survival, but it was living, I no longer felt like I was like in a state of constant survival. Yeah. <laughs> it became like, what is the water teaching me? You know, but also reading Terry's book and knowing more about the structure of swimming. And they're, they're, at the beginning of this semester, I went to the water and I realized five things that the water promotes and has become values for me in my life. First of, in, in no order, but balance. You have to be able to balance in the water. Simplicity. The water is simple. The water gives and it takes. The water is very clear about what it is going to do for you. The water is constant also, right? And, and effective fish life swimming is simple. Fr front quadrant swimming, swimming as if you're feeling like you're going downhill, finding that balance, it's simple, right? Hand swapping, it's simple. Where, where was your hand before? Where does it need to be? It's constant. You know, the water, it's a place of buoyancy. How can we create buoyancy in our lives? And the water is clear. <laughs> the water is clear. There's clarity in water, right? And it's not, it's not just like a, a philosophy of being a swimmer, but it is it's also a philosophy of how can I be as healthy as a person? Yeah. As I, as I possibly can be for myself, emotionally, how can I communicate those things? And how can I keep those values outside of the pool? How can I be buoyant in, on, on land? <laughs> that, that is very like Zen. I like that a lot. You know, like the, the Zen traditions talk about how you can learn everything from anything. Hmm. Terry mean. also. He's, <laughs> he's very Terry. zen, isn't he? Very, he's very, very, zen. He's very zen. Yeah. 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 He has the third principle of Kazen swimming is love the plateau, oh, which is, man. which is, um, I think it's some principle, some religious, like Eastern religion principle, like the right now, he's like the first few months that you are in TI, you have rapid changes in your swimming. The first time I got into the water after I read a chapter, <laughs> I was mad at Terry because I was like, yo, he, did, he really did break it down for us. Like, I was like, what? My whole relationship to the water changed in one session, right? And that's from reading a book. Re knowledge is power. Um, but after the, that time of like rapid change, you have to love the plateau where it might not feel like every session you're getting anywhere but it will create a giant leap forward at some point in time but that's also true for our lives like you might be in a situation where you don't know it's you don't feel like you're getting to your goal or you're not as successful as you want to be but you have to love the plateau in your life and that's a way of being compassionate to yourself yeah absolutely absolutely and being excited about the process more than the product oh yeah such a Mm. excited about the process not over the product yes absolutely yeah absolutely it's huge i'm gonna steal that is that is that yours that's all of ours uh, <laughs> My, <laughs> that's the universe that's the universe <laughs> love it that's the water yeah love it yeah so look when you come and visit me next i got his i got that book that they mentioned mastery Oh, uh, cool, cool, cool. I'm excited. Um, I just have two last questions for you, Jordan. Okay. One is, what are some texts you would suggest me to read? You always for, give me great book recommendations. Re recommendation. For what? That's the question. Um, trance, hypnosis. Three books. Because I know you've read <laughs> so many. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, I really like Douglas Flemings' text, Of One Mind. Okay. Um, and that whole book is, 
using the logic of hypnosis for change. And mm -hmm. I think it, I think it's, I think it's, I think when I first read it, I didn't fully get it. But the more that I studied this stuff, the more that I'm like, yeah, right. Like, because the book, you don't learn inductions, you don't learn, you know, magic words or whatever he may be people think hypnosis is. Mm -hmm. It's all about how do you relate to yourself? Mm -hmm. How do you relate to your issues? And how can you do that in a way that is um, connecting rather than separating? Wow. Um, it's a brilliant book. That's the first book that I would read. Um, that might be the only book that I would recommend, especially okay. for a lay person. So you've got to start there, I think. Um, I think in addition to that, I'd start, I would start a meditation practice. Mm. Um, if you don't already have one, I think, you, I think back to the beginning of the episode of the, of the interview, doing is so much more powerful than trying to think your way through. Yeah. Um, and then I would, I would recommend reading a paper. Um, I would recommend two papers. They're interviews. Okay. One cool. is an interview that Connie Ray Andreas did where she met with Milton Erickson. Awesome. And one is an interview that Paul Ekman did when he met with the Dalai, the Dalai Lama. Mm. Um, both so of those really, about that, yeah, both of those really underscore the power of compassion. Mm hmm um, I would also pick up pick up a book called Quantum Change by Bill Miller. Beautiful book. Um, and then if you read through those, I would probably pick up uh, Ann Cohen and Karen Olness's text on hypnosis with with kids, which you need to go in that order because you you will get blinded by, so basically Karen Olness and uh, Dan Cohen wrote this book. It's basically a massive literature re review on, oh, um, wow. on hypnosis. Oh my gosh. Um, but if you, if, you, if you read too much hypnosis literature, you'll get blinded to the fact that it's not about the trance work. It's not about the hypnosis. It's about how do you see people and how do you help them relate to them to themselves? And what is the quality of their attention? Those are the things, the things you need to be paying. Otherwise, you'll get you'll get blinded by the other stuff that seems sort of flashy. Mm -hmm. Awesome! Wow. And last question: What are you reading right now, just in your life? I'm reading like three different books. Yeah. <laughs> I'm reading this book called Alchemy, The Dark Art and Curious Science of Creating Magic in Brands, cool. Business, and Life. Hmm. Really good. I'm reading a book called Mind Fixers, Biology's Troubled Search for, Psychiatry's Troubled Search for the Biology of Mental Illness hmm. um, by Ann Harrington, who I hope to have on the podcast. She's a brilliant historian. Exciting. Um, I'm also reading a book called Wool by Hugh Howey. I think his name is. Um, and that's for fun. That's just a book about, it's like a dystopian book about the future. Fiction. Yeah. Awesome. W O O L. W O O L. Yeah. Wool. That's a hard word. That's awesome. Uh, are there any last things you'd like to say to share with your listeners? I think as far as, you know, this is a podcast mostly for students mm -hmm. who want to be really good at what they do. And I think the one thing I would say to students is, um, I think that the far side of complexity 
where you have that informed simplicity is possible, but you have to do two things. On the one hand, you need to always be, you need to be working intermittently, but very, very intentionally on your own process, watching your tapes, thinking about your context, mm -hmm. um, reviewing your, your clients. I do a brief client review at the beginning of each day for that day. Um, and what you'll find is that you will learn through incremental steps. And then I think the other side of that is, is um, in your day to, in your day to day life, give yourself some downtime, mm. but also work on being compassionate to yourself and to other people. Um, Cause that's the meat that carries everything. Um, if you do those two things, you're going to be fine as a, mm. as a therapist. You, you, you really will be fine as, as a therapist and you'll also be fine as a, as a human. Wow. It's beautiful. So that's what I would say. Thank you so much, Dr. Yeah, Jordan Harris. This was fun. Thank you for interviewing me. So much fun. Jalen was... Harris. <laughs> a true pleasure. Um, and thank you so much for sharing with us. And also thank you just for creating this podcast. This is an enormous resource. Oh, man. An enormous resource for the layperson as myself and students and practicing therapists, you know? Yeah.